And our next invited author is Amanda Burson, and she is here to present her publication from LNO 2016, and the author of the pub uh, the title of the publication is on the slide there. So please join me in welcoming Amanda. That is very rocky. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me on behalf of myself and my co-authors. Uh, we're really pleased to be here for this session. And I will be presenting some work that I actually did during my PhD, um, as you can see, entitled Unbalanced Reduction of Nutrient Loads Has Created an Offshore Gradient from Phosphorus to Nitrogen Limitation in the North Sea. So let's dive right in. So just a little bit of a staging of the system. So the North Sea is a shallow coastal sea. It's uh, economically and ecologically very valuable system, but it's also highly influenced by anthropogenic nutrient loading, obviously from the rather populated Western European region. And as we've heard in a few presentations, this has led to eutrophication problems, just a few things listed there. Um, for the Dutch in particular, because I did my uh, PhD in Amsterdam, the phaocystis blooms were an issue. Uh, they, in, during storm seasons or even just high wave, the, the blooms create this big scum layers on the beach. Uh, it's such an impact on tourism and just became so, such a part of life there that they even named a uh, beer out of it after, after it. It's called scum copa. And I can say that it is very tasty. Um, I kind of made it my, uh, every time a paper came out, I had to toast it with a scum copa. So that's my little mascot. So to deal with this eutrophication problem, um, a coalition of European countries came together, uh, this is the OSPAR Commission, and they agreed that there had to be a nutrient reduction of inputs. Uh, that reduction was going to be, the target was 50% of the loads that were being measured in 1985. And then fast forward a little bit, and you see that this is also, I would say, a success story, in that the phosphorus loads were reduced um, up to 70% in some input points. But nitrogen loads, due to the agricultural issues and the much more challenging aspects of reducing nitrogen, uh, were only reduced by 20 to 30 percent. So this kind of directed us to the overwhelming, overreaching question of all of my research for my PhD, which was how will this imbalance in this reduction impact the nitrogen phosphorus stoichiometry in the system, and how does that then also impact the growth limitations to phytoplankton, and then also the community structure of that phytoplankton within the North Sea. So to undertake this, we performed multiple uh, research cruises on board the Dutch vessel, the Palahia. Um, the research cruises started from seven kilometers offshore of the island Trishelling and progressed to 450 kilometers into the central North Sea basin. And this island of the Trishelling region, and, and here, it all falls within this region of fluvial influence, which is what that represents. And then if you move out into the North Sea, central North Sea area, it's more North Atlantic water influences. So we would expect some changes in the stoichiometry and the, and the environment along this transect. Uh, to look at how there might be limitations to the phytoplankton community, we've performed several uh, nutrient amendment bioassay experiments. They were conducted on board during the transect uh, through these flow-through incubators. We added several different nutrients and also in combination to look, about, look at uh, co-limitation effects. So there's obviously loads of data from this, but I'm going to go ahead and just focus in on the dissolved inorganic nitrogen to dissolved inorganic phosphorus profile and just to quickly orientate you with this figure. Um, it's a depth profile. These are the four months that we perform the cruises. The near shore station is this uh, on the left side and then moving out to the outer shore station here on the right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just focus in on the April cruise, and I'm doing that for several reasons. Mainly, this is when we had the highest phytoplankton biomass. Um, not only did we have the highest phytoplankton biomass of all the cruises, but the highest phytoplankton biomass was also in this near shore region. But probably more uh, impactful is the fact that this is when we had the largest gradient of our N to P ratio. So in the near shore station, we had 375 to 1 N to P, and the outer shore station, we were getting... Um, NDP ratios of less than one. So we'd expect phosphorus limitation to be in the near shore, nitrogen in the outer shore. Just as a reference point, we have this 16 to one isocline, the, the red field ratio. 
Now, we also wanted to have a, have a look and see if those stoichiometric ratios are being incorporated into the phytoplankton themselves. So at these four stations here, we also looked at the particulate matter. And you can see um, the near shore station, this is station seven, especially in April. You see that the particulate organic nitrogen to phosphorus is well above the red flood ratio, which is, is the dashed line here. That shaded area is kind of the range that we find in literature that phytoplankton can also be considered uh, quite growing quite well in. Uh, particulate organic carbon to nitrogen had a different trajectory, whereas POC to POP followed this path. And now I'm going to focus a little bit more on the POC to POP. Uh, this is because C to P ratio is considered a pretty critical stoichiometric uh, consideration when you're thinking about phytoplankton as the base of an aquatic food web, their nutritional value in terms of higher trophic levels. And the reason for this is, this is a concept called stoichiometric homeostasis. And the idea is that phytoplankton have a pretty broad range of CDP ratios in which they can grow and, and be happy. However, higher trophic levels have a much more constrained range, range of uh, stoichio stoichiometric needs. And that means if we are introducing copepods in our system to a phytoplankton that has a CDP ratio of, say, 560, it will have to incorporate much more carbon than it requires to meet its phosphorus demands. And eventually it has to deal with that carbon, probably most likely through respiration. <clears throat> now that's time, and well, first of all, that's a pretty big waste and inefficient use of carbon through the food chain, but it's time and it's effort and that could have been utilized for growth or reproduction, et cetera. So this was kind of the first point that we really highlighted in our manuscript as being a potential issue to the productivity of the system is that we're probably not, and remember the near shore region is the region where we had the highest phytoplankton biomass during the spring bloom. So we're probably not producing the most nutritionally valuable phytoplankton for the productivity of the North Sea. Now moving on to the bioassays, let me just quickly, there's a lot of graphs here, but I would quickly orientate you. All of the rows are the cruises, so that these are all the March cruises, March results, April results, and then I kind of clumped the later season results together. The near shore station is represented here, 100 kilometers off shore, 250, and then finally the central basin. So I'll just walk through some of the observations we had from the growth bioassay experiments. Um, firstly, the near shore station, both in April and in the later season, so actually, sorry, March we had no uh, effect of nutrient additions on the growth, so nutrients were not quite limiting yet. But in April and May and August, we did see an effect in the near shore. We saw independent co-limitation of both phosphorus and silicate, meaning that phosphorus on its own, but also silicate on its own, was limiting growth. Um, in 100 kilometers offshore in April, we had serial co-limitation, first of phosphorus and then silicate. So once the phosphorus uh, pressure was relieved, then silicate that quickly became limiting. In April in station 250 kilometers, we have a simultaneous co-limitation of nitrogen and phosphorus. So just take a minute to appreciate that that's 250 kilometers away from fluvial influences, and we still have phosphorus playing a role in limitation in this marine system. So not necessarily something us as oceanographers often think of. And in May, August, now we're starting to see a little bit of a, of a shift towards nitrogen first, and then phosphorus, so as denitrification starts to play into the system. And then finally, at the station 450 kilometers, which again I said is the most influenced by this North Atlantic seawater, we see nitrogen limi limitation in the outer shore region. Now, we also wanted to look into how not just the whole phytoplankton uh, community at, at large, but I also wanted to consider how, that, how the community composition could potentially shift and how that could change uh, how different phytoplankton groups might be experiencing uh, limitations in different ways, obviously silica being an obvious example of this. So first, we'll look at diatoms, which we know is a pretty important component of a healthy spring bloom. Um, and yes, indeed, we had limitation of diatoms by silicate, but we also had an independent co-limitation with phosphorus in many stations um, in the near shore. So that means that diatoms are now experiencing 
in the North Sea are now experiencing a dual pressure, not only silicate but also phosphorus. So in terms of their competitive ability to displace other uh, phytoplankton groups, they might be having like an extraneous uh, pressure on them. Picoplankton, picoeukaryotes, and picocyanobacteria, which are also very critical uh, components of a spring bloom. We also found that they were experiencing phosphorus limitation, particularly in the, the nearer shore stations. So that's another factor of a spring bloom that we're starting to see issues. Phaeocystis, uh, I suppose in a way you could say that this was a, the good point, the congratulations point of this study is that yes, phaeocystis does seem to be limiting, phosphorus limited. Uh, it's still a bit light limited. This was the only group that seemed to be light limited in the near shore. But um, if you're trying to reduce your scum copa, uh, then phosphorus limitation for phaeocystis seems to be the right management tactic. However, this is the group that kind of surprised us. This is the dinoflagellates and the nanoflagellates. And we did find limitation, but we found um, co-limitation, simultaneous co-limitation with nitrogen, meaning that these groups, the dinoflagellates and the nanoflagellates, were not um, being limited by inorganic phosphorus. And the reason why we think this might be is that they, a lot of members within this group can practice mixotrophy. So we're thinking that perhaps they're compensating for this inorganic phosphorus reduction by incorporating organic or uh, particulate matter. So what does that mean for the community composition or the potential future community composition of this system? Well, we could be seeing a scenario where the double pressure on diatoms is reducing the um, presence of, of like let's say preferable spring bloom species with an increase in, in species that can perform mixotrophy such as dinoflagellates. And now the, this kind of brings us to the second major warning that we had in this paper was a lot of dinoflagellate and nanoflagellate species, we see examples of toxic forming bloom species. So it's perhaps not a, uh, a group that you want to give a competitive advantage, especially in your near shore and fishery dominated regions. So just a little bit into how this paper has been received. As, as Maggie said, it, has, it was produced and published in 2016. Um, there has been studies since looking at the higher trophic levels, and they tend to focus on the total decline of primary production or the total decline of nutrient loading, which yes, both of those things have happened. But unfortunately, well, not, maybe not unfortunately, these papers do give a nod to the fact that there might be a factor of nutritional value of the phytoplankton or community composition, but the nuances of that are still yet to be teased out. And so there's a lot of research that could go into really understanding how this stoichiometric play is affecting higher trophic levels. However, um, there are some citations for more management-related bodies. Uh, this was an Irish report and then more of a uh, yeah, policy-related uh, ma manuscript, where they do really take on board the idea that the balance of the nutrients is as, as or can be just as, or more, I, I would almost argue, critical to maintaining a, a good deutrification strategy. So some take-homes from my North Sea study. Obviously, the unbalanced reduction has created this limit, limitation gradient in the North Sea. Um, the, the phosphorus limitation has reduced the nutritional value of phytoplankton, in particular in the near shore region. And this has group specific impacts. Some, some phytoplankton groups are experiencing phosphorus limitation differently than others. And I also did a lot more uh, focus studies using chemostats uh, to really kind of investigate further the N2P ratios and nutrient load uh, interplay. And you can read about that in my ecology papers, or I do have some secret extra slides. If you guys want to see it from questions, we'll see how much time there is. Um, and so overall, however, uh, there are, I'd like to say that my take home, my big take home message is that the balance reduction of both nitrogen and phosphorus is required for nutrient management of any aquatic or marine environment. So you have to remember that <laughs> upstream processes have an effect on downstream. Um, so that's where I'd like to summarize, and I just, oh, I just turned that off, sorry. Uh, I want to give a thanks to the group that I did my, my research in, and also a thanks to the University of Nottingham, who are letting me take skeeve off of work to come give this presentation, even though I didn't do the research there, and my contact information, so thank you.